Now that we've seen the objectives of a SCADA communications protocol, let's take a high-level look at DNP. We'll begin with a general overview, including the history and present usage of DNP3. Next, we'll look at typical operational features of the protocol. DNP stands for Distributed Network Protocol. It was developed by GE, previously Harris or Westronics, and was based on the early parts of IEC 60870-5. After developing the protocol, Westronics turned it over to a users group. This was a rather unusual move, since most manufacturers at the time kept their protocols proprietary. It turned out to be a very smart move, however, because the open protocol gained wide acceptance throughout the world. Today, DNP is used worldwide, including North and South America, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Asia, and South Africa. It is well known for its use in the electric utilities industry, but it is also used in oil and gas, water, industrial, and other applications. DNP and IEC 60870-5-101 have been specified in IEEE P1379, Recommended Practice for Data Communications Between Intelligent Electronic Devices and Remote Terminal Unit. Newton Evans Research recently conducted a study of communication protocols. They found that the DNP3 protocol is the most popular protocol in use in the North American electric utilities. One of the Newton Evans surveys looked at the current and planned uses of protocols within the substation. As shown in the graph, DNP3 is the leading protocol currently used within the substation. DNP3, especially land-based implementations, is also the leading protocol for planned usage within the substation. Another survey looked at the current and planned use of protocols from the substation to the external host or network. Once again, DNP3 is the leading protocol for this application. Furthermore, DNP3, especially land-based DNP3, is the leading protocol for planned usage in this application. The DNP3 protocol is owned by the DNP3 users group and is available to all members. Basic membership cost is only $300 per year. The DNP3 users group currently has members from vendors, utilities, system integrators, and software developers. All of the committees that make up the DNP3 user group are staffed by volunteers. The DNP3 technical committee is responsible for the managed evolution of the protocol. This includes providing clarifications to the specification, as well as recommending enhancements. The technical committee is chaired by Andrew West of Invensys Process Systems Australia, and the secretary is Alan Scott of Noja Switchgear Pty Limited. The committee meets via conference call twice per month and meets in person once a year. In addition to this, the committee interacts daily via a mail list. The technical committee leads the managed evolution of the protocol. If the protocol never changed, it would become stagnant and fail to meet people's needs. But if it changes too often, then it's too difficult for vendors to remain compliant, thus the need for managed evolution. The committee defines new features, updates the documentation and test procedures, and presents these to the users group for approval at the annual meeting each year. The committee clarifies existing documentation when different interpretations exist as well. This results in a controlled standard. It avoids multiple vendor-specific variations of the protocol. DNP3 documentation includes the specification, conformance test procedures, and technical bulletins and application notes. The DNP3 specification is provided in eight volumes. Volume 1, the introduction, provides a good overview of the protocol. The remaining volumes provide details on various aspects. Some volumes contain more than one part. For example, the data object library consists of three parts. All of the DNP3 documentation is available for free download from the DNP website by DNP user group members. The DNP3 specification is very comprehensive. It would be impractical to try to implement every possibility described in the specification. Consequently, the DNP user group has adopted four subset levels. The subset levels break the specification into more manageable pieces. Each subset level represents an interoperability agreement between devices of the specified subset. Each subset defines a specific set of functionality that must be supported for that subset. Each subset includes all of the previous subsets. Subset level 1 is designed for small IEDs. It uses simple polling, including class polls, which will be described later. Subset level 2 was designed for large IEDs or small RTUs. It adds object type polls 
extra data formats, and other useful features such as counter-freeze operations. Subset Level 3 is designed for very large devices. In Subset Level 3, the master can pull for any combination of objects and ranges. It allows for a larger combination of data formats and also allows for reassignment of classes. These features will be discussed later. Subset Level 4 was approved at the annual users group meeting in February 2007. It adds several new features, including an XML version of the device profile document. A Level 4 device must provide an XML version of the device profile document containing both the capabilities of the device and its current settings. This file may be obtained by a means other than DNP file transfer. For example, it could be generated by a PC-based configuration software and delivered via CD-ROM or USB mass storage device. Level 4 also adds self-address reservation. With self-address reservation, if a device receives a message with a destination address of hex FFFC and the self-address feature is supported and enabled, it should respond normally with its own source address instead of FFFC. Subset Level 4 also adds additional data formats, including Object Group 0, Device Attributes, Double Bit Inputs, Variations with time for frozen counters, frozen counter events, and analog input events. Floating point variations for analog inputs and outputs. Analog input reporting deadband. And event objects for binary and analog outputs. While the features of higher subset levels can be useful, normal DNP operations rely on subset level 1 functions. There are several ways for members to stay current with the DNP Users Group. The DNP Users Group holds an annual meeting each year at the Distributech Conference. This meeting is open to members and non-members alike. The meeting contains presentations about the status of the various committees and about the protocol itself. The technical committee presents its recommendations and upcoming areas of focus. Members can vote to adopt new specifications and technical bulletins at this meeting. The DNP Users Group website contains a What's New section on the front page. This area is an excellent source for keeping up with DNP-related news. The DNP Users Group website contains a forum which can be used by DNP User Group members to resolve questions or share information. The DNP Users Group also periodically publishes a newsletter and other information broadcast to DNP User Group members. In addition to the protocol specification documents, archived copies of presentations about DNP are available on the website as well. Now let's take a closer look at the protocol itself. In this section, we'll discuss data acquisition methods, data classes, and report by exception. In DNP3, static data refers to a point's current value. It is common for a class 0 poll to return all points in the outstation. This is not required, however it is acceptable to have points that are not returned by a class 0 poll. In this case, these points can only be read by direct reads of the point. However, DMP requires that any points in class 1, 2, or 3 must also be in class 0. Data can be in class 0 and not be in class 1, 2, or 3, however. The following slides look at DMP data classes in more detail. In DMP, the term static data refers to a point's current value. A class 0 poll returns the current value for all points in class 0. As mentioned before, any points in class 1, 2, or 3 must also be in class 0. Data can be in class 0, but not be in class 1, 2, or 3. In DNP, events are associated with something of significance happening. This is most commonly a state change or a change in the data's value. However, it could also be because a value crossed the threshold or exceeds a dead band. It might also represent a snapshot taken at a particular time. DNP supports three events classes, called Class 1, Class 2, and Class 3. The protocol specification does not assign any significance to these classes. Some installations report binary input data in Class 1 and analog input data in Class 2. However, data can be assigned to the classes in any manner that makes sense in the system. Classes may also be assigned and changed via the protocol. An event poll, that is a class 1, 2, or 3 poll, only returns changes or events. DNP3 supports report by exception, or RBE. With RBE, the outstation only reports data changes. 
RBE can be used with polling or with unsolicited responses. With RBE, the outstation adds changes to an event buffer. It may add all changes, only the most recent change, and which type is added can be configured per data type. Data from the event buffer can be sent via unsolicited responses or in response to a class poll. The data remain in the event buffer until it is acknowledged by the master. Events, or data changes, can be reported either as a sequence of events or as only the last change. With sequence of events, all events are reported, and they are typically reported with timestamps. Digital inputs are typically reported in this method. With last change, only the most recent change is reported, and is typically reported with a variation without a timestamp. Analog inputs typically use the last change method. Here is an illustration of reporting events via the report by exception mechanism. First, an event, for example a binary input change or an analog change in excess of the deadband, occurs in the outstation. The outstation reports this change via a response to a class poll or via an unsolicited response. The master confirms receipt of the events by sending an application confirm. The outstation removes the reported events from the event buffer only after it receives the application confirmed from the master. This guarantees delivery of the event to the master. Let's take a look at the difference between static data polling and event data polling using a digital input as an example. In this example, the master polls at a specified interval. Each poll time is indicated by the vertical black lines. At the start of our example, the input is low or zero. The input then transitions to a high state. Whether the master polls for static data or event data, the device will report the high state on the next poll. However, with DNP event data, the outstation could also report the time of the transition. Next, the input transitions low and then high again. With static polling, this transition is missed as the device reports the current state, or high, on the next poll. However, with event polling, the device reports both transitions. During the next poll interval, the input transitions low again. With static or event polling, this transition is reported. During the next poll interval, the input does not transition. With static polling, the current state, still low, is reported. No events are reported with event polling, however, because nothing has changed. During the next poll interval, the input transitions high, low, then high, and then low again. With static polling, only the current state, low, is reported. All of the transitions have been lost. With event polling, however, each of these transitions are reported. If capturing transitions are important, then either the static poll rate must be high enough to capture them, or event polling should be used. The beauty of report by exception and event polling is that all transitions are captured, with timestamps if desired, despite using a slower polling rate. This can potentially reduce bandwidth requirements. When using report by exception, it is important to report all consecutive samples for each data object in the same order it is read. This allows the sequence of event logs to be built. The master station updates its database in the order that data are received. With this methodology, the final value will be the most recent value. However, should the event buffer overflow, the master must reinitialize its database by reading all current values. DNP3 supports multiple methods of retrieving data. Master outstation networks typically use pulled static or pulled report by exception. In point-to-point -point networks, unsolicited report by exception and quiescent operation may be used. With the pulled static data acquisition method, a class zero or specific data request message is sent to each device and the device returns the requested data. With pulled report by exception, a class 1, 2, and or 3 pull request is sent to each device, and the device responds only with the events for the requested class. An occasional integrity, class 1, 2, 3, 0 pull, is used to ensure that the database remains in sync. With unsolicited report by exception, the outstation sends unsolicited responses containing changes or events. 
This allows the master station to be updated on events without the need to pull. However, it requires some type of collision avoidance mechanism if multiple outstations are sharing the same media. In addition to receiving unsolicited responses, the master station occasionally sends Integrity Class 1230 polls to verify that its database is up to date. With quiescent operation, the outstation only reports data via unsolicited responses. The master never pulls the outstation. This method is most commonly used in point-to-point -point networks. It is useful, for example, in dial-up applications in which the outstation dials into the master to deliver its unsolicited responses. The DMP3 specification requires that any master or outstation device that supports unsolicited responses must also support the enable and disable unsolicited response requests. Furthermore, the specification states that when an outstation restarts, all points must be disabled from sending unsolicited responses. The outstation must still send its initial null response, that is, an unsolicited response with no data. However, it may not send unsolicited responses with data until it receives an enable unsolicited response request from the master. Note that the outstation may still be generating and storing events before it receives the enable unsolicited response request. It is just not allowed to send those events via unsolicited responses. DNP is based on a set of paradigms. To ensure maximum benefit and interoperability, these guidelines should be followed. First, use report by exception. The master should read an initial image of all field data using a static poll to retrieve the current state. All changes should then be reported using report by exception. DNP uses a separate event buffer for each data type. All data reported from these buffers must be in increasing time order. That is, the oldest is reported first, and events are reported in time order until the newest is reported. DNP treats binary input and double-bit binary inputs as a single data type for the purpose of reporting events. That is, single and double-bit inputs are reported together in time order. As shown earlier, DNP confirms reception of events, and events are removed from the event buffer when they are confirmed. Note that when reading static data, either via class 0 or reading specific data types, you should always read event data in the same request. The DNP3 specification requires the event data to be sent in time order ahead of the static data. This procedure ensures that the database will remain in sync. If event data are read after the static data, the database can be updated with old information if the events occurred before the static data were read.